Or in Patrick, it's all yours. I mean, hello everyone and welcome uh, to this webinar hosted uh, with Webset. Uh, my name is Patrick Pease and I'll kind of run us through some discussion on heating cooling loads, kind of how we calculate them, why they're important, uh, how we can reduce them, because uh, there's a lot of advantages to doing that. Um, so I'll hang on for you know, 30 some more seconds and I'll dive into our agenda today. So yeah, diving right into our learning objectives. Um, first, we're gonna talk about identifying primary drivers of load, you know, what causes this load in our buildings. Um, describe some strategies to reduce that load at an early design stage, you know, when we're first on your project, how can we help to reduce them? Uh, understanding the connection between loads and cost. You know, these aren't just numbers that go into you know, our designs for our airflows, et cetera, they do have costs associated with them. And then just talk about some, just some really easy workflows that we can use to, to help optimize as well. So for the agenda introductions, we'll go through quickly, get on to low monthly basics, onto HVAC loads and capital costs. We'll get some strategies for reducing those, uh, go through a quick example project as well. Uh, and then we should have some time for some Q&A. I think the whole thing should take us about 15 minutes, so that should be should be excellent. Uh, just a quick overview again, just to introduce myself. Uh, I'm the Mechanical Engineering Director at CoTool. I have well, now over 10 years of experience in AEC. Uh, I went to school at Boston University. I'm a member of ASHRAE, ABIPSA, uh, and SIPSI. And for those of you that are new perhaps to ABIPSA, definitely want to introduce you know, this great organization. You know, it's a society for building performance, you know, practitioners, researchers, developers, you know, all, all that. Uh, and they put on these webinars, they, they put on great conferences and have a lot of great resources. So definitely, if you haven't checked out your know, BIPSA USA, definitely, I recommend doing that. Uh, so diving into kind of our core topics to, for today, uh, what is a load model? Uh, so a load model is, Primarily, the calculation of heat into or out of an environment. That could be an entire building. That could be just one room. And the scales can slide based on what we, we need to do. Uh, it's also the primary design basis for our HVAC system. So talking everything from a diffuser in a room all the way up to you know, your central plant. Maybe it's a, a chiller plant. Maybe it has a cooling tower. All of those pieces of equipment, all those interconnections, they first start as the results of a load model. So they're very, very fundamental to what we're doing. Um, another way to, to think about it, it's always a rate of energy to maintain that indoor environment to a desired temperature and humidity. Uh, so that temperature and humidity could be set based on comfort criteria, maybe it's an office, or maybe it's a data center and that, that criteria has more to do with the equipment we would still run a similar kind of um, load model to determine what the requirements are for our, for our design. Uh, so components of a load model, uh, first we'll have the building envelope. You know, this would be all the glazing, all the exterior walls, the uh, roof of course, all those elements, the internal zones. So again, if we're looking at a whole building, we might have hundreds of zones. If we're looking at just one room, we just have one zone. Uh, but those, those zones are you know, part of our load model. We also have the airflows. So in this case, we're talking you know, ventilation, you know, how much outdoor air is required in the building. That's going to go into my load model as well, because that determines you know, an additional load to my building, because uh, outdoor air, uh, by its nature, will most likely not be the temperature that we want it to be in the space. Uh, there are a few locations around the globe where you know, likely is, and natural ventilation is a really good solution there. Uh, but unfortunately, for much of uh, the US, you know, peak temperatures especially are far from ideal, and we have to do some conditioning. That's a load that gets introduced. Uh, speaking of those you know, conditions, external condition of the project uh, is important. So this is really the weather. What are our design days? You know, what's the hottest day of the year? What's the coldest day of the year? 
And also what's the most humid that would be for our new evaporative designs as well. And then the system as a whole, that's gonna go into the load model. So what's in the system? Is it air uh, only, like a, a VAV type system? Or is there some hydronic portions like near reheat coils or, or a pin tube? That's all gonna impact you know, our, our calculation. Uh, so some really quick load basics. Uh, first, just typical units. If we're in IP, we're talking you know, BTUH. Or if we're in SI, we're talking watts. You know, those are the, the primary units that we're using. So I have 12,000 know, BTUH in my, my room. That's the load I need to, to counteract. Um, we've talked about this a bit already, but again, we're talking point in time when we're talking a load model. So when's the specific time happening of that load? We're not looking at yearly results. That's more on the energy side. We're really talking you know, what's the exact time this happens. That's going to be the worst case. You know, uh, load for my project. Um, typically, these are going to be done with a computer program. There are means to do it by hand, because of course uh, we had to be calculating loads with, uh, far before computers. I certainly wouldn't recommend any of those today. They will be time consuming and uh, very difficult to do at scale. Um, and there are many methods available. So heat balance and rating time series uh, by far I top two. But there are nuances there, and you can see these in, in many calculation programs. And even uh, digging into ASHRAE fundamentals, they'll discuss you know, the various differences with the, the methods that you could use. But they're all essentially going to get you to a similar answer of you know, how much heat's in my space, what do I need to deliver to that space to counteract that. Uh, so just to close out, heating loads and cooling loads. Cooling load is actually heat causing unwanted increase in temperature. Uh, and that's an important phrase there, unwanted. Um, if we have, for example, fin tube radiators in our room, those are emanating heat into the space. But as long as they're controlled correctly and they're only you know, on during perhaps the winter, that's not unwanted increase in temperature. That's you know, desired, that's part of the design that's meant to be there. So that wouldn't be considered a load. Now, if we had, you have very poor controls and that was on during the cooling periods or during the summer. We might have to you know, accommodate that in our cooling design, but a much better practice would be to fix those controls and not have you know, that fin tube on at that, that given time. And then similarly, heating loads, it's unwanted decrease in temperature. So heat we're losing most often from the building through the envelope. That's gonna be the primary cause of, of heating loads. And again, it, it's unwanted. If we have, for an example, uh, in a home, perhaps a attic fan that's pulling out air uh, in the evening and it's being replaced by cool outside air, that's not an unwanted decrease in temperature. That's you know as designed. That wouldn't be a, a heating load. That would be, in fact, you know the cooling system itself. Uh, so again, the unwanted portion is is important here. Having a look at those loads themselves. So sources of loads externally. Uh, conduction is going to be one of the major ones. You know, all the surfaces of our building will have some form of conduction. Conduction, of course, in this case, is just the transfer of heat uh, through a surface that is adjacent to two different temperatures. So heat will always travel uh, from higher to lower. And so in winter, when it's colder outside, heat will leave the building. In summer, when it's hotter outside, heat will enter the building through conduction. Uh, solar radiation, that's going to come in through our windows. And of course, that will add heat to the building you know, based on those windows, you know, the size, and also the performance, the solar heat gain coefficients. That's how much that solar radiation can be blocked by the glass itself, which will reduce some of that load. Uh, other means to reduce load might be things like shading devices, which would be you know, a, a strict, like was blocking all of the daylight. Whereas properties of the glass itself can also reduce you know, some of that solar radiation. Internal loads are really just everything in the building. Uh, so typical examples would be, of course, equipment like laptops, computer screens, all of those. Uh, people, in this, this image is actually my cat. All of these will be giving off heat into the space. Uh, for people, this was you know, a sensible and a latent load. You know, we give out some moisture as we breathe. 
that goes into the space, and that's a load that must be counteracted if we want to maintain temperature. Uh, lights, also a very common one. Uh, internal conduction. Internal conduction is an important one because this is where we capture the, essentially the transfer between rooms that are at different temperatures. Now, in some you know, projects, this might not be very large. So, you know, if the whole building's an office, it might be kept at relatively the same temperature. Not much heat is transferring from one to the other. If we, by contrast, perhaps have uh, maybe a data center with an office attached to it, the data center portion might be kept at, you know, say 85, 90 degrees, and the office at 75 degrees. And now that's a temperature differential, which we'll see heat being transferred you know, into the office from the hotter data center. And that's something we would be captured in a load model. And then another load that will count you know, at the room level will be the ventilation. Uh, so the ventilation would be the outdoor air we're delivering to that space to make sure it's breathable, we're meeting our you know, CO2 requirements, we're meeting standards um, like ASHRAE 62.1. Or in some cases, perhaps this is a safety thing. You know, with COVID, we saw a lot of advent of you know, increased ventilation you know, to keep the places safer. That does increase load, the more outdoor air, because it won't be at the ideal temperature, it will increase load as well. So now, kind of moving into, well, how do we equate you know, HVAC loads to cost? Um, so what we've talked about so far is really just the load aspect, you know, typical units of, of BTUH or watts or CFMs, but all of those do have a cost associated with them. So some pretty typical examples would usually be it's a dollar amount per unit, and that unit will be something like tonnage of a chiller. So say it's $50 per ton. If I have a certain number of tons, as a certain expense. If it's... Um, dollars per CFM for an AHU, if I have a 5,000 AHU, CFM AHU versus a 10,000, that's a different cost. We can kind of you know, take this simplified approach to calculate it. So on and so forth for things like pumps and you know, diffusers and bank oil units. Each one has a cost, and if I have less of them, I'll have less cost. And now, of course, I'm not going to dive too much into detail of you know, cost estimating that kind of uh, approach to really get down to the nitty gritty of these, um, but this is re these are really good, essentially rules of thumb to always be using when we're designing. You know, if we know that the cost of our grim is roughly equated to its size, we can start to see savings. We can start to equate those for ourselves before that cost estimates you know even done. So definitely using these rules of thumb is very helpful. So just to run through a couple examples. Um, for example, perhaps my air handling is for a project. We know they're going to cost eleven dollars per CFM, and that's kind of like the all-in costs for perhaps it's a package system. Eleven eleven dollars a CFM. If I have one design where I need ten thousand CFM, and that's coming from my load model based on my internal loads, my glazing, all of that, that's going to be you know one cost of about one hundred and ten you know hundred thousand dollars. That's one cost. Now if I have an alternative design, maybe I've reduced plug loads, we've gone with a slightly higher performing glass, you know, whatever the case may be, and I've been able to reduce that peak CFM I need to cool the space to the 7,000, I get a 30% cost savings on that unit alone. So even again, before we go to the details of the cost estimate, I can do these quick, you know, arithmetics as I'm doing my design, to see if I'm you know, making a positive impact. Am I optimizing you know, that cost for the project? Uh, another good example, kind of at the unit level, uh, this is getting down into maybe how many fan coils we need. So perhaps with design one, you know, it's a lot of glass, perhaps it's low performing glass. You know, I need three fan coil units to meet the load. That's you know, the cost of the fan coils themselves. The cost to install, the cost to wire, the cost to you know get the condensate back. There's a lot of costs associated with you know essentially a per unit your approach. So if we assume that's about five thousand, you know fifteen thousand, you know for those three pan coils. Now if the design is modified, you know in this case I've shown you know essentially a reduction in the glazing. This could also be optimizing the internal loads, the lighting design, you know, whatever the case might be. 
But if I can reduce that load down, and now I only need one fan coil unit, I essentially cut that cost with t in two thirds. And that you know, is a great impact. So this is you know, an example of one room, but if that room is repeated you know, across the whole project, these cost savings can really add up. And these are the kind of choices that kind of early on we can make and know they're gonna have the impact that we desire, even you know, before the cost estimator comes in and, and does like the really detailed calculation. You know, we can have confidence that you know, two less fan coil units will be significantly cheaper than, than one fan coil unit. I think getting a bit more complicated on uh, the example. So this would be example of a south facing laboratory. Uh, so in this example, we have pretty high plug load. This is a lab, so there assumes you should have very high plug loads, uh, about 10 watts per square foot. Also has a large south facing window, so we're going to have a lot of solar gain. Uh, but it is a lab, so we know we're going to have six A changes you know, in that lab. So we know that has a lot of capacity. So just using you know standard you know 20 degree delta T for that, my cooling capacity is about 26 uh, thousand BTU. Now, if I look now at the load breakdown, however, the equipment load itself that we can see is already 40,000. So even though we had you know, a large quantity of air being delivered that has to be delivered uh, for the safety of the space, that equipment load's already making that much larger. Tying that with the solar load, we're up around you know, two, 20 air changes in the space. So we went from only needing to deliver six to suddenly needing to require 20. So a huge you know, uptick in the airflow. And that will see cost increase at ductwork sizing, at diffusers you know, in the space, we'll need more diffusers. And of course, at the AHU, this is repeated for many labs. We'll see all of them you know, increasing that AHU size you know, exponentially. They'll get bigger and bigger. Now, if we take that same lab, and we do a couple things. First, maybe we do some reviews with the owner, with, with the staff actually gonna use it. And we talk through that, that assumption of 10 watts per square foot and we say, well, what are you actually gonna install? What's gonna be used at the same time? What's a more reasonable you know, estimate for the loads? And perhaps we get down to four, which I've, I've seen on some past projects. So that's definitely you know, a possibility. So we can reduce that down to start. The other thing we can do is we can locate that lab on the north base of the project instead of the south. Uh, now, we'll assume this is in the northern hemisphere, so that means our solar gain is going to be much reduced because we'll have less you know, direct solar gain uh, throughout the day. What that's done for us is it's brought our equipment load down to, well, below what the six air changes is providing. And all total with the other loads, we only need about 11 air changes if it was you know, straight. Uh, fresh air into the space. Now at 11 air changes, we can likely, you know, do something perhaps with an active chill beam or maybe with a local fan coil to help offset it and keep things to just the six air changes, you know, at the AHU. And so right there, what we've essentially been able to do is reduce the load at the central AHU per, per each of these labs, perhaps there's, you know, several in the projects by 45%. So again, we're able to make an impact to the sizing of equipment and by correlation, the cost of that equipment you know, very, very effectively. So that's one example uh, around labs. One other example I wanna run through, this is your classic, um, you know, rotate the building from narrow north-south to narrow east-west to see the impact. So in this example, just a 10 by 60 office tower, about seven floors, very highly glazed. I think I did about 80% glazed. Um, this one, in this example, it's located uh, in Atlanta just for location. You know, simple box model EY, getting about 38. So, okay, that's, that's about the energy we expect per year. If I look at the cooling load, it's about 100 tons. So that's the cooling load on the project, you know, based on that orientation. Now, if I take that same project and the only thing I do is rotate it 90 degrees, and this is, you know, the typical thing a lot of standards will ask us to do, look at, you know, if we rotate our project, what's the impact? Now, if we look at the energy, it was still just about 38. It dropped a little bit. And this is really, you know, due to the annual impact of things. Things over a whole year average out. You know, the heat gain that was really hurting us in 
uh, the summer months, having extra cooling energy is being offset by some reduced heating energy that we required in other spring months. So over a whole year, the differences are very, very minor. So not a good argument, really in either direction for what orientation the building should be in. However, if we look at that you know, peak load again, in this orientation, we're 88 tons. And so in this simplified example, that's a 12% peak load savings. So if we're talking cost, that should be a 12% roughly cost savings for the mechanical system. And now that's something to actually you know, talk about with the design team and say, this is a reason to rotate our building. You know, 12% is you know, actually not nothing. So discussions can be had more easily around this about what's the better orientation if we look at load and not just energy in this case. Because again, those peak times are going to see more changes when we look at these, these kind of studies. So kind of a quick takeaway, um, less equipment is going to equal less cost. Small equipment is going to equal less cost. Less load equals less cost. And kind of a bonus as we start to think about this in the building industry as well, will be less body carbon if we have you know, smaller ductwork, smaller pipework, smaller systems, that's less. You know, if we just do a per tonnage calculation, you know, there's a lot of work to be done to understand exactly how much less, but we know it will be less. So that's always something to look out for. And so, yeah, just always kind of think about less is less, less is not more in this case, uh, always trying to reduce the loads as we go through. Um, so next I'll go through some of the key drivers of the loads and then into kind of a more detailed example as well. So key drivers of load, uh, typically for cooling, there'll be things like solar radiation, equipment, lighting, and people. Um, depending on location and exact project, this will be different, uh, certainly in projects. Uh, at very high temperatures, the conduction can get up there as far as you know driving the load. Or projects with little to no internal gain whatsoever, again, conduction can get in here. If they have a lot of windows, solar radiation will just drive all of it. The equipment and the lighting won't do much at all. Some other exceptions will be ventilation. So again, going back to those labs and healthcare type projects, uh, if those are present, they have much higher minimum requirements for ventilation. That brings that you know, more into focus as far as the loads. Um, other places where that ventilation can become more of a driver is going to be high heat or high humidity climates, as, especially. Uh, so in those climates, the energy or the, the load required to bring that air to temperature will be you know, significant and will you know, start to uh, shape how the total load for a, a building shapes out. Another exception that's important to think about is actually infiltration. Uh, for new buildings, often and more so every year with you know better constructions and better codes, infiltration we assume to be relatively low. You know, we assume we got a pretty tight envelope. Uh, we'll use some assumptions based on that. But if we have an older building and you know, perhaps it's not getting a renovation to the envelope. You know, it's likely very leaky. And in those cases, infiltration can be very high. Uh, certainly difficult to measure, but if we include that kind of load in the project, you know, we, we might see that's very high. Uh, so ways to identify that load. Um, there's a couple different you know, methods around here, but really, I think the first way is, is always to graph it. You know, go to your, your typical end uses, your equipment, uh, lighting, you know, envelope occupants, all of those, and just put them into a pie or, or a donut chart, whether uh, you know, fits your design best, and just see what it looks like. You be able to very quickly see, you know, what's driving the load in the spaces. Is it, you know, the, the solar gain? Is it the envelope load? Is it the occupant load, et cetera? Um, and so this could be done, you know, quickly, early stage, room by room. You could do this for a whole building as well. Uh, but if you do it room by room, you do get the advantage of now you can drill into the templates for those rooms, your assumptions. Because uh, your assumption you know, isn't going to be for the whole building. You're going to have assumptions even early stage room by room. So definitely kind of putting in a graph helps to 
to visualize for the team what's going on. So a couple strategies to reduce cooling load. Um, number one is going to be you know improve soil heat gain coefficient. Uh, better soil heat gain coefficient again reduces the amount of heat passed through that glass into the space. Uh, this can mean you know tinted windows, you know that thing, uh, that you know things like frit, etc. And those, of course, need you know very careful coordination with the architects, you know, for the overall aesthetics of the project. So that's you know definitely a coordination effort. Will always be the glazing. Um, this should actually say glazing, so reduce the amount of glazing. That's always an option. Again, that needs to you know go with the architects. How are, is the vision for the the project working out? Are we getting enough daylight if we reduce that glazing, et cetera? So that's one to work through as well. Uh, one other strategy, and the important word here is horizontal, is adding shades. Uh, shades help by blocking out peak load. Um, again, if you look at energy, they can average out energy-wise very often. But if designed correctly at the right you know, location and, and angle, they can 100% cut out the peak loads that rooms will see, which can be very effective. And that would be typically with horizontal. Uh, equipment and lighting can also help to reduce the loads, and they can, again, be difficult. You know, a lot of these things we're talking about as mechanical engineers or energy and load modelers, they're not in our scope as far as specking them. You know, we're not in charge of the windows. We need to coordinate with the architect. You know, even the design teams often not in control of the equipment being installed. That's a discussion that needs to have with the owner. Uh, this really brings us back to um, things like the integrated process. You know, if we want to reduce the loads, we can talk to the owner about installing, you know, energy star type equipment, you know, into the spaces. We can reduce that as soon plug loads, reduce the size of the system, all these kind of impacts. Uh, diversity is something that you know, engineers can review. So we can definitely check that we're using the correct diversity in the project as well. Um, for people, that's really where diversity is going to come in a lot. Uh, definitely want to make sure we're always assuming the correct activity and diversity. Uh, diversity for uh, a whole floor plate is important. If we know that there are 500 desks you know, in the office, but we know that this is actually a hot desking type office and we're not expecting you know, everyone to be in every single day, perhaps we can increase the diversity. If we have conference rooms, we definitely can increase the diversity. Uh, so making sure we're not oversizing in that respect by, by looking at the whole picture and not just kind of the specifics of each room is helpful. Uh, for ventilation, number one, and, and very common in most codes now, is to add energy recovery. If we add energy recovery, we're essentially transferring heat from the air that's already conditioned in my, in my building to that outdoor air so we can save a lot of load uh, with energy recovery. Uh, another more nuanced way to do this is to look at the ventilation efficiency. So if we're looking at uh, ASHRAE 62.1's ventilation rate procedure, there's an efficiency to how we deliver the air. If it's you know, hot air delivered at high um, outlets in the space, so ceiling delivered you know, warm air, that doesn't mix as well down to the occupants as if it was cooler air or air that's you know, the same as the ambient temperature. So if we can adjust the design somewhat to have a better ventilation efficiency, we can actually reduce the outdoor air that we were, we're required to deliver. So that's one other way to reduce you know, the ventilation load. Um, infiltration, another big one. Um, so of course, improving air tightness, that's gonna help a lot. And this is again in coordination with the architect, with the envelope designer. And even the the contractor to make sure the actual install you know meets these requirements. Um, oftentimes we can put in values into our simulation models, you know 0 0.06 or you know 0 0.05, whatever the case may be. But if that number doesn't get into a specification and get into the design, we're gonna you know, not actually see that in the built environment. So making sure that's always coordinated through to the res responsible parties is going to be important. And then, of course, just from the mechanical design aspect, just always making sure the building is positive. This also helps just to make sure the number we're assuming is actually what we're going to see. Uh, buildings that 
are accidentally negative. And by negative, of course, what we mean is we have more exhaust, so we're extracting from the building than we're supplying more than outdoor air. And in that case, we're literally you know, sucking air through the envelope, kind of creating more infiltration. And that can lead to a lot of additional load, either locally where the air is filtering in, perhaps by a garage, or just for the whole building as a whole. And that can really you know, tax you know, the heating system, especially. So that's always something to look at. Making sure the buildings are positive really helps with the infiltration. Uh, so key drivers for heating load, um, these will typically be conduction or infiltration. Again, that same exception is going to be for labs and healthcare. They have a lot more outdoor air. That's often going to drive it uh, as far as uh, the heating loads for those types of buildings. And then cold climates as well. If it's extremely cold out, you know, even a small amount of outdoor air is really going to drive the load you know, into the space. So always things to look at. So conduction, as we touched on very briefly, uh, is really about the heat transfer through a surface, most typically a wall. And so ways we can help counteract that, of course, increase insulation that will reduce the heat transfer. We can also reduce the window to wall ratio, so less windows. Um, no offense to architecture, but a lot of the ways to reduce load in a project is just to have fewer windows. Of course, it needs to be tied with, with daylight and everything like that, but they are you know, a big kind of sunk cost as far as load in, in projects go. So that's one other way to help you know, reduce the, the load. Infiltration, we already talked about, air tightness, and making sure the building is positive. Uh, so now I just have an example project that I'll run through just with a couple of examples of how we can look at the load and then reduce the load. So again, just for this webinar, a very simple project to get us through. So we're looking at about you know, 6,000 square foot office I located it in Boston. So relatively cold climate, not extremely cold, but uh, certainly colder uh, than where I am today actually in Atlanta. Uh, just two stories. Uh, envelopes to Massachusetts stretch code. We're doing just about 25% window to wall, so not very high window to wall in this case. And we're going to assume it's just one uh, kind of package issue for the whole project. Now we're going to do some just initial results. You know, essentially just taking that initial project, let's run one the loads so we can understand well what's what's driving the load in this this given project. Uh, so in this case, I'm going to look at the conference room first. I can see right off the bat the things driving my load are the glazing and the solar radiation. And that's actually very similar on the heating side too, the glazing conduction and infiltration is driving my heating load. So again, kind of in this workflow, we take that initial project, we just run it straight through and see what the zone, your room level results are, and start to identify what's, what's driving the load. Looking at the whole building now, so this is, I'm looking at the HU itself to see what's driving the whole building load. I can see radiation is one thing, and then people in this case is, is the other aspect that's driving the load in my project. So two, two elements I can look at to help reduce. Uh, for heating, blazing conduction, and infiltration, those actually match between that, that one room and then the whole building. And so in these initial results, I can take what I've learned to start to modify my design or suggest modifications that will help reduce the load. Now, in this case, I've just looked at the conference room, but perhaps you know, on an actual project, I might look at every single room type to help me identify how can I reduce the loads in that type of room. So for design modification, we'll look at two things. We'll reduce the glazing size. So if I take those windows, which was about 25%, you're gonna take about a quarter off of each one. Uh, so probably now we're about you know, 20, 19% window to the wall. And we're also going to go for a higher performing envelope. So we're going to increase the envelope air tightness uh, from 0.06 to 0.03. So we're really going to kind of go for you know, a very high performing envelope, which of course uh, is going to increase the cost of the project. And that's always something that needs to get you know, flushed out through things like LCCAs, et cetera. Uh, but just for uh, illustrative purposes here, we'll use these two inputs. So when I modify just those two settings, I see that now in my conference room at least, my glazing conduction still 
one of the things driving my load, but now the second highest is actually the people. And now the people in this case, I might not be able to impact too much. You know, it's a conference room, it's probably sized for an exact number of people, and it's gonna be sized for when all those people are there. So that's, you know, a good point to say, I've reduced the loads you know, pretty well based on the envelope and I've hit you know, the next highest peak. And so in that case, I've been able to reduce uh, down to 23%, which is excellent. You know, there's 23% cost savings, well, not, not directly cost savings, apologies, but load savings, which will impact the cost and reduce that. Uh, same on the heating side, in this case, about 40% load savings. And again, you know, the, the driver now has changed. That's a good indication that the, the steps you've taken to reduce the load were you know, aggressive enough. You know, if I've been able to change now that external walls is the second most prominent you know, heating load, that means I've reduced the impact of the infiltration you know, below the top priorities, so that's helpful. For the whole building, uh, again at the HU, I see a similar story, so about 14% savings and 31% savings. Uh, again, you know, I've reduced the glazing uh, across the whole building and I've you know, reduced the infiltration. Uh, and in this case, I see that overall, I still have the glazing conduction and the infiltration driving the heating load. So perhaps I can suggest an even more uh, aggressive performance change, maybe you know, increase the performance of the glazing, not just reduce it. If I wanted to, you know, switch out uh, the glazing conduction from being one of the drivers, and then similarly on on the cooling side, you know, I've definitely cut out you know solar radiation, which is good, uh, but people still driving driving the load there, and that's probably perhaps where I want to be. If I know that the people I've estimated in the building is correct, that means that that's I'm really allowing that to drive the load, drive the size. And nothing that's not related to kind of the mission of the building, you know, the occupants is driving the loads for the project. So in that case, I've been able to save again, you know, 14 and, and 31%. And so just to kind of close things out, again, going back to what we talked about earlier, less load will equal less costs. It will also equal less embodied carbon, you know, less is less. Uh, running kind of a really simplified analysis early allows you to know what's driving your design quickly and make suggestions to improve upon and reduce that further. Always identifying that largest contributor helps discussions because now we can talk about, well, what's actually you know, causing this to be you know, the size it is. Uh, if it's not you know, the glazing or the, the wall, and it is in fact the number of people and the equipment, then we want to have the right discussions with the right people because, of course, they impact you know different parties. And again, you know, I touched on it very briefly, but this was you know just a relatively short webinar going through the loan aspects, but never forget about the trade-offs and things. So, you know, in some of these examples, we reduced glazing, which perhaps that might also have a cost savings. But in one of those examples, certainly I went with a tighter envelope. That's definitely going to have an increased cost. So making sure that that trade-off is considered, you know, increased cost in one location to save costs in another uh, is going to be important to the overall project design. I want to show too just a few, you know, resources out there. Um, so one really good reference for doing these kind of early stage load uh, cycles, as they're called actually in the standard, is ASHRAE 209. Uh, so energy simulations is designed for buildings except low rise residential. Uh, so if you haven't read that standard, it essentially presents a series of cycles, modeling cycles for a project, only one of which is required as part of the standard. And the one that's required is actually load reduction. So that one's looking at, you know, some early stage modeling of the project, seeing the peak loads and looking at how we can reduce those peak loads. So that's when we consider you know, is this an important step? You know, here's a standard that says, you know, all these things are great things to do, but this is the one that you actually should be doing every single project. So definitely kind of drawing that in focus. Um, there's also a lot of self-paced loading classes out there that go into a lot more detail on load design. I can definitely recommend, our ASHRAE has some e-learning out there, uh, and we also have an academy as well with some courses on there. So definitely as you're, you know, learning more about load design, definitely you know, check those out um, as you go through. And that 
will be the webinar for today. I want to thank everyone for listening. Hopefully that was you know, helpful and informative and kind of went through some really common you know, actions we can do in every project to, again, reduce that load, which will reduce the cost and reduce the embodied carbon as well. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for listening. It looks like we have a few questions, so we can go through those now. And definitely uh, feel free to add any more to the Q&A, and we can address all of them. Let's see. Oops. Let's see, let me answer this first question here. Uh, so a question, how can weather data help in optimizing heating and cooling loads? Uh, this is a good question. So I think the most important factor here is to make sure you have the right weather data and the right design data information. Um, climate change is happening very, very quickly. And not all weather data is updated yearly, certainly. Um, but tracking that to make sure you have the latest is helpful. Uh, so for example, ASHRAE 169 has the latest design day values and climate zones designated. Uh, ASHRAE Fundamentals also has those published every four years, I believe. And just making sure you're using the latest can help to make sure you're reflecting what the design should be. Uh, and where this is gonna impact the most is where climate change is happening the fastest. So some regions globally, uh, the heating temperatures might be going up. That's going to increase your cooling load. But again, if you look at the, that same location, actually, the, the heating peak, you know, maybe it was 10 degrees in the original file that was 15 years old. Now it might sadly only be 20 degrees, which means your heating system can be smaller size. Certainly shows that global warming is happening as well. Uh, but just making sure you have the right values as a starting point is, is going to be very important. Awesome. Are there any other uh, questions that came up as part of the, the webinar? Uh, if there are none, kind of immediately, definitely feel free to reach out. Always happy to talk about uh, kind of load modeling, uh, especially using it to optimize our designs. You know, this, they are fundamental to you know, how buildings are built, so that a lot of discussion can be had about you know, how we use them, you know, how they're going to impact the overall design. Uh, and just how we can really optimize things, um, et cetera. Excellent. I see there's one more question. So let's see. Can you get extreme weather conditions for load optimizations from EPW file, which represents typical conditions? Uh, so that's a good question. So you can get extreme weather conditions now from the ASHRAE design day information. It is, I believe, documented in the main. Uh, sheet that's in Ashray Fundamentals, for example. Um, if they're captured in specific EPW files, I don't know offhand. I'd have to follow up to see if those conditions are documented in the EPWs as well. Uh, but certainly, I know Ashray has published some extreme weather conditions that could be used. Um, whether those, I think, unfortunately, because they're extreme, they might never reduce the load they'd always increase the load, so adding essentially a safety factor on there, perhaps. Uh, but certainly something to consider as you're calculating the load for a specific project, especially if it's mission critical. That's really, I think, where those extreme weather conditions have been shared for. Let's see, we have one more question. So how proactive are you in proposing and evaluating uh, compromise solutions for cost reduction with the owner and project manager? Uh, so this is a great question. So it's certainly going to depend on the projects and the relationships that the team has put together. So for those integrative design processes, so that would often be a lead project, but is often seen you know, on more and more projects because it is very effective. That's really the ideal case because people should be you know, in design charrettes and having these discussions. And those are really the ideal ones. Uh, in other cases, you know, proposing you know, compromises, you know, can come down to what's your relationship with the architect like? You know, is this a project that's open to reducing cost? You know, that kind of thing. You know, as long as you frame it in the uh, 
the interest of the party you're proposing it to, so an owner or project manager, we don't really want to frame it as let's reduce load, et cetera. We want to frame it as let's reduce cost. That, that's what will you know, be interesting. Uh, so certainly, definitely recommend doing it on every product. It's going to be easier on projects where you have better relationship with the whole design team. But certainly, if you frame it in you know, the, the things important to the owner, to the project manager, cost, it's going to always be an easier discussion as well. Here we go. We're going to have a really good question, actually. So how should green space, for example, on a roof be accounted for in the envelope loads? Will a grassed roof area typically reduce the cooling load or will it have a warming effect? So this is a good question. So green space, let's just call it a green roof, will have a couple different impacts. Um, so typically, a green roof will actually have a much higher insulation level, perhaps, than your regular roof. Because you think about it, you have the roof itself and then some planting, some seeds, et cetera. So it might actually you know, reduce your heating load because your R value is higher. So that's, that's one thing that could be very good. And then, you know, depending on what the other option for the roof is, your uh, solar radiation, your reflectance, your, your reflectivity will be higher. And that can reduce, of course, your heat island effect, which would reduce if your outdoor intakes are on your roof, your overall heating load. Now, some of those nuances might not be picked up automatically by a load calculation program, but there are certainly things you can start to account for you know, as you're looking into more details. So if you consider uh, you know, a dark roof, so it's a black roof, that's gonna be very, very warm and hot. And it's gonna increase locally that heat island effect, the outdoor air brought into a building, that's gonna increase the load. If we replace that with, you know, more typically nowadays a, a white colored roof or, or, or grass, that heat island will go away and that extra heat you near know, the building scene also will go away. Um, so definitely can have several advantages, both the heating and cooling you know, with a, a grass roof. Let's see, we have another. Can you speak to any examples of load reduction using thermal mass with night ventilation? Uh, this is a good example. Um, so when we talk about night ventilation and well, thermal thermal mass, we kind of bridge the gap between is it the actual load of the project or is it how the system's designed to operate? Uh, so with thermal mass, um, using the various methodologies, so the radiant time series, we do look at you know heat stored in the surfaces and then expelled over time, and that can help shift peaks, and if we shift peaks enough, perhaps they don't align, which reduces the load for the project. So some will ask and certainly have that effect. Um, one kind of argument there, though, is if we're doing that fashion, are we really changing the load of the project with night ventilation, or are we pre-cooling the project with night ventilation? So almost load shifting. Um, certainly, you know, when you just calculate the peak, it's one thing, uh, as opposed to um, calculating just for you know the system integration as well that's more of a load shifting than the load peak uh, perhaps but definitely something to consider as you're designing through excellent we have a couple more questions as well so yes we mentioned data centers do you find less insulation in data centers uh, is less uh, that's a good question. I personally don't have too much experience uh, designing data centers. Uh, I think certainly from you know, the internal loads of them, having less insulation would allow more heat to escape. However, if you are trying to tightly control the environment of the indoor space, which for a data center you are, typically your design approach wants to be to insulate as much as possible to eliminate any interactions. You just want to control the internal loads and really negate any external loads whatsoever so that the control of the building is very, very easy to do. If we have you know, a low performing envelope, not only does the system need to counteract the internal loads, but needs to counteract any interactions that might be happening, which can lead to you know, drifts in temperature that we don't want in a data center. Uh, things of that regard. So definitely something we want to perhaps avoid. However, I could definitely see, you know, from the calculation side, you know, taking advantage 
of a poliform facade if we are perhaps in a cold climate. Uh, but certainly something for the design team to kind of work through uh, as they're, they're designing through the, the details of the systems and the controls along with the loads. See, so we have one more question. Uh, will ISBE become an industry standard tool for load calculations? It's a great question. I believe IES is using Apache, which is a very good engine and one of the kind of main ones out there. I think the other main one is NG Plus, which is again a very powerful you know engine uh, for doing load calculations. I wouldn't really expect that either becomes the industry standard. Uh, I think if we had one calculation engine that could lead to stagnation and just kind of you know lack of innovation. Uh, so certainly you know that two calculation methods or engines really exist. I think helps the overall industry because uh, they can both you know improve the other and improve the end result for our design projects. So I don't think there'll be just one, likely there'll be you know, multiple engines always available. Cool, so this was some, some really excellent questions. I'm glad everyone uh, you know, got something you know, from this webinar. Hopefully it was very helpful. Um, looks like, yeah, it doesn't look like we've seen any others. Um, so I want to, again, thank everyone for attending and thank you, uh, Mike and Abipso USA for, for hosting this. It's always great to kind of share with this community. And again, if you haven't you know, checked out Abipso USA, I definitely recommend doing so. They put on a lot of great educational content. Uh, it's definitely well worth a look. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you, everyone.